Well, we can get started here. Um, it looks like we have a good number of, uh, of the people that RSVP'd um, that have already joined. So before I, before I jump into anything, I want to first off um, introduce myself. Uh, my name is Phil Hamburger. I'm a risk advisor uh, at Eller Brock Norris. Um, we also have uh, Seth Denson, our chief strategist um, on our uh, health and wellness team. He'll, uh, he'll be running the, the webinar with me. Um, he's got a lot of experience uh, when it comes to legal changes, um, legislative changes, and also compliance changes um, when we think of employee benefits. Um, so he's kind of the, the expert on our team, and we always like to, to bring him on um, and kind of uh, give, his, uh, give his thoughts and um, opinions on some of this stuff, because some of the stuff that we're going to be talking about today, um, it's kind of... It's, a few of the items are still up in the air when it comes to, to what's uh, actually going to happen um, and what's, you know, the potential impact that it'll have on employer sponsored health plans. Um, but we'll, we'll dive, at, dive into that here um, shortly. Again, um, I, I know a few people jumped on. Uh, if you have questions, there's a chat box on the top right. And we will also have a copy of the, the webinar available to send out um, to all of the people that are that are on today, um, and if you want to uh, send it to anyone, there will be uh, it'll be on our YouTube Eller Brock Norris YouTube page, um, so you'll be able to check it out there as well. So we'll kind of we'll get started here. Um, so obviously, the the topic of the webinar today is um, understanding the impact of the Consolidated Appropriations Act uh, on employer sponsored health plans. Now. There's a lot that's included um, in the Consolidated Appropriations Act. And throughout this webinar, you might hear myself or Seth refer to it as the CAA, because it does get, obviously, you know, saying Consolidated Appropriations Act over and over again, um, gets a little, um, gets a little uh, boring, I would say. Um, so we'll, we'll uh, reference CAA um, as we kind of go through here. So now, before we jump in, I want to kind of talk about why we're holding this webinar. First and foremost, we here at Ellerbrock Norris um, and also GDP Advisors, we, we believe um, that education is key. And we really focus on educating our clients um, throughout the whole entire year. If that, when that comes to compliance changes, you know, any le legislative changes, we really focus on you know, making sure that we're getting in front of our clients and also prospective clients and educating them because first and foremost, obviously, we want to make sure that we are looked at as the advisors and the consultants and not just a broker who is um, helping them with their health insurance. So, again, if, if you have any questions after um, the webinar, feel free to reach out to us. We'll be more than happy to answer your questions or talk through anything with you um, if you'd like to set something up. Now, the Consolidated Appropriations Act, um, it actually came out in uh, 2020, and it slowly kind of gained traction over time. And there's really four key areas of the CAA that we're going to talk about today. And those four areas are, uh, the first one is it removes gag clauses from service provider contracts on price and quality information. There's been a lot of talk um, over the last year um, and even further about um, transparency uh, when it comes to healthcare. And there, there hasn't been a lot of transparency. So we'll touch on that um, a little bit today and kind of what that means uh, for employer sponsored health plans. The second thing is uh, it establishes reporting requirements for prescriptions. Now, if any of you have sat on any of our previous webinars, you probably heard us talk a lot about prescription drugs. And the, the price of prescription drugs is just continuing to go up and up year after year. So this is something that, you know, it, it's not, it's nothing's been set in stone yet, um, but we'll touch on this as well, um, because as you all know, and you've all probably heard us talk about, prescription drugs is one area within your health plan that um, there's typically um, tremendous opportunity for savings. Um, strictly because of the price increases that we've seen over the years. Now, the third thing is it requires a disclosure of direct and indirect compensation from all service providers. Um, again, we here at Ellerbrock Norris and GDP Advisors believe in full transparency um, when it comes to the compensation um, that we receive for our clients. So we'll touch on that and kind of what that means to um, you as the employer. And then the fourth thing is, is it requires parity and substance abuse and mental health uh, benefits. So those are kind of the four key areas that we're gonna focus on today. Now, 
we're not going to dive in too deep to any of those sp specifically because there is a lot that um, is included within the Consolidated Appropriations Act. But really, our goal is um, we want to make sure that the, as an employer, you're aware of what the Consolidated Appropriations Act is and also some things to be thinking about um, moving forward. So, Seth, before I um, jump into anything, anything that you'd like to add there? Uh, listen, I think a couple of things that I'll just add to that, uh, Phil, and I thought that was a good opening introduction. Um, and there's no shortage of, of folks that are out there talking about what the CAA means for employers and, and stuff. And as Phil alluded to, this bill was almost 6,000 pages long. So uh, we're not going to cover it all in an hour. Uh, and so what we're going to do is highlight specific areas that we think are of importance right now that you need to know. Meaning, this could be a 30-minute discussion. Uh, over a 6,000 page bill because there's a lot that's left to, to be determined. Uh, most of the bill actually was was kind of, as far as requirements and, and, and reporting and things like that was kind of pushed out. So Phil mentioned the, the prescription drug reporting requirements. Uh, these are things like your top 50 drugs and some of these other things. Uh, that, that's been pushed out in large part because pharmacy benefit managers said, well, wait a minute, this is proprietary information. If we start releasing it, uh, you know, we, we could be in trouble. And they were going to sue. So a lot of these things, much like we saw with the Affordable Care Act, right? The Affordable Care Act was passed in 2010. It's 2014, 2015 by the time most of it got rolled out. So under the CAA, uh, there's going to be a lot of things that I think come out over the next, I don't know, uh, year really over the next six months that will be impacted over the next year and so forth and so on and so forth. What I think I want to encourage everybody here, if you're freaked out about this, don't. There's a lot of latitude and a lot of grace right now because quite frankly, the Department of Labor, the Internal Revenue Service, um, they're, they're all re-looking re at this and saying, how do we set forth regulation? Remember, under the Affordable Care Act, it was over 2,000 pages. This was over 6,000 pages. Uh, so uh, it three times the, the length of the Affordable Care Act. Now, there were over 11,000 pages of, reg, of regulatory information added after the Affordable Care Act, and we've just started getting into the regulatory side here. So uh, just kind of set your mind at ease. Life is fine. We're going to figure this out together. The second thing that I would say to you, though, is this. Phil, neither Phil nor I, unless he did it over the last couple of days, uh, are attorneys. Uh, and so what we are not going to do is give you legal advice. We're going to give you our opinion, and that is where that ends. Um, and so here's where we think things are. If you do have specific questions, the good news is we have attorneys on staff. So we've got five legal experts that we can ping and pull into this. Uh, and if they, they should probably be here, Phil, doing this. But <laughs> here's the reality is I sat on a couple of them with them and they are fantastic. But and I, my apologies to any attorneys that might be on the call. Um, you get wordy. And I think you get wordy because you bill by the hour. So no, I'm kidding. Not really. But nonetheless. Um, Here's the thing. We want to make this clear and concise. Here's what I need to know now. But understand there's going to be multiple follow-ups. If you have specific questions, send them to Phil or myself. We'll get with our legal team. Uh, we'll get you a written answer for it, and we'll go from there. No, yeah, I appreciate that, Seth, and that's um, that's a great point. We are, uh, I myself, I know I'm uh, am not an attorney, um, and do I, I do not see myself ever being an attorney. Um, so I do appreciate you mentioning that. Um, we are not give, here to give legal advice. Um, one thing, Seth, that I wanted to, to kind of uh, touch on before we dive into maybe any of the specifics of the CAA is, you know, obviously um, this has, you know, potential implications for employers who uh, offer an employer-sponsored health plan. Now, one of the things to think about is, you know, what does it mean to be a fiduciary and how do you limit your liability as a fiduciary um, when it comes to the, the, the health plan that you as an employer are offering? Yeah, uh, that's a man. That's a great question. Something we have uh, discussions about with prospective clients all the time, uh, which is there is nothing more important than your plan document. Now, plan document is not. Repeat this. It is not what you would get from Blue Cross, United, Cigna, Aetna that says here's how your deductibles work. Here's how your coinsurances and copays work. Your plan document is actually the governing document, or what we call, oftentimes we'll call it an ERISA wrap document that says, hey, we as an employer, here's how we manage our benefits. Here's how we make sure that we are, you know, compliant from a discriminatory perspective. Here's how we protect HIPAA data. Um, here's how our plan works. Here's who's eligible. Here's when they're eligible. Here's when they're not eligible. All of that stuff. Now. If you are fully insured, we don't see you, so you can't raise your hand. But if you are fully insured, you still have to have an SPD, Summary Plan Description, or an ERISA wrap document. Why? Because you are a fiduciary. 
If you are an employer and you provide a, a health plan to your employees or a dental plan or a vision plan or any of that stuff, right, you have taken a fiduciary responsibility under ERISA to govern the plan assets, which, by the way, your employees contribute to, uh, to the benefit of the plan participants, not the company, okay? So you, as the plan sponsor, are the plan's fiduciary. And that doesn't matter if you're fully insured or self-funded. We've got a lot of calls on that saying, well, good thing I'm fully insured. <laughs> no. If you think that that's the key thing here, it ain't. You still are the plan fiduciary. And Blue Cross, United, Cigna, Aetna do not give you summary plan descriptions. They don't. They will issue you a plan certificate or an SBC. We love acronyms in this business, right? So, which is a summary benefits of coverage, right? They'll, they'll issue you those that say, here's how the plan works, but it is not the governing document that you, the plan fiduciary. So what does that mean? If you are in a fully insured plan, you need to have an SPD, okay? What the CAA just did is said, hey, you know what? You need to have an SPD. Uh, and so what do you do? You can get those drafted. We'll pick on our attorney friends again, uh, somewhere between $1,000 and up to $5,000, depending on how complex or how good you think your attorney just might be that he should or she should earn five thousand dollars it should cost you less than fifteen hundred to two thousand bucks all right um it is just called that cost of doing business you need to have one now if you don't have one that's fine you're rolling the dice if the dol shows up uh and does an audit and you don't have one they can fine you uh up to 125 dollars per plan participant per day that you did not have it and they have no statute of limitations they go way back uh so we encourage everybody to have an spd uh, and that's on all your plans, which we would do what we call an ERISA wrap document. Okay. Now, if you are self-funded and you're working with a reputable TPA, they should be providing this to you. That's part of the implementation and onboarding process as a self-funded plan. They'll build the SPD out. Now, here's what you want to make sure that your SPD is in alignment with your employee handbook. And it's in alignment with all the different plan coverages you offer, right? So medical, dental, vision, life, disability, any of those things, you need to make sure it's all outlined and wrapped together. If you don't have a risk wrap document, okay, that's fine. The key thing is, is a SPD on your health plan, but I would uh, encourage you in a risk wrap that wraps all of those things together to make sure you're protected. But you've always been the plan fiduciary. <laughs> I want to make sure to reinforce that. Uh, since uh, the seventies, when ERISA was put in place, you were named the plan fiduciary. So a long way around the barn field of your question, which was, how do we limit liability? Well, two, two key things, right? One is, make sure you have, have an SPD or an ERISA wrap document. If you don't know what those are, send us a message. We'll get you all the information you want to know on how to do that, what you need to do, and if you need resources to get that done, we can certainly help do that for you. Um, second thing is, make sure you're working with a reputable TPA if you're self-funded, because a reputable TPA is going to make sure your all of your plans are in alignment. Now, for those of our our clients here at Eller Brock GDP uh, that are in our captive program, um, we actually have a law firm on staff on retainer that assumes fiduciary liability. So in other words, they can't take your fiduciary liability, but they assume it alongside you, meaning that they're going to review all the documents. We always make sure that our team does that uh, and make sure everything's up to par. So if forever ever there was a reason something went awry, you got a great legal team right behind you that's effectively assuming the liability, saying, hey, we've looked at this and it's good. We're, we're so confident that it's good that if the client gets sued, we're getting sued too. Um, and so that's really important. Uh, but the best way to mitigate that is A, make sure you're working with a reputable TPA to help you build that out. If you can, outsource fiduciary liability, or I should say co-fiduciary liability. But if you're fully insured, don't just think uh, that, that you're good. You got to have all these things in place too. Blue Cross United, Cigna, Aetna, they will never assume fiduciary liability for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great point, Seth, and that's something that um, I was asked as well over the last month, really since I started sending stuff out was, you know, if you are fully insured, you know, should you be worried about this? Are you the fiduciary? And, and as you mentioned, um, you are, in fact, uh, the fiduciary. And one thing that um, I wanted to to kind of piggyback on there is, um, and and also kind of ask, you know, and get your opinion, Seth, is within the the CAA, obviously, you know, the 6,000 um, page document, there, there's a lot in there. And one thing that, um, you know, is, that is included in there that, you know, I doesn't really make a lot of sense on how they would monitor or, um, you know, oversee this is it talks about documenting changes, um, 
And, you know, being obviously a fiduciary, um, you know, when you make a change to your um, employer sponsored health plan, um, it talks about having documentation on, you know, for example, if you're changing TPAs, you know, basically documentation on um, uh, all of the different TPAs that you spoke with or got uh, received an RFP or a quote from having that, um, you know, in a file. And then also um, a short summary on maybe why you made the, the decision to go with the TPA. Now, when you think about that, obviously, you know, employers are, are making, you know, the best decision for their employees and also they're taking in their, you know, budget, you know, in, in play when they're making decisions like this. Now, when we think of like, you know, the potential implications that could come from not documenting, can you kind of just maybe touch on if this is something that's even viable or if this is something that's, you know, way down the road that, you know, might get rolled out. Um, but it was something that was interesting in there. And I was kind of thinking more thinking through it on how they would actually oversee or govern, um, you know, this when it comes to documentation for employers when they make a change. Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I think that the key thing to think about here is for those of you that have a 401k plan, for example, uh, you are required as the fiduciary. Uh, to go undergo what are called what's called 404c compliance, right? Which means that hey, our plan assets, the availability of fun assets, things like that, the availability of different funds, uh, we've done a check of the market and made sure that our plan is is compliant, that we have the best interests of our employees at heart. We can thank Enron in large part, I think, for maybe uh, some of that compliance requirement. Uh, but nonetheless, I think this is the attempt of the CAA is to say to do the same thing for the health plan. Now, it's a little bit different, I think, in the health plan from a perspective of employers, by and large, under ERISA, uh, they, they can't find a way to to make money or do things um, inappropriately in a health plan. It's almost it's very hard to do that. Um, but this is, I think, them trying to align uh, health plans with what we already see in the 401k market. So. What does that mean? Well, first and foremost, uh, let me let me explain things a couple of different ways. And again, I'm saying this again because I know it's being recorded. This is not legal advice. Okay, there you go. Um, but uh, so, for example, Section 105H. Uh, I am super fun at parties, by the way. If anybody's ever wondering. Um, so Section 105H uh, applies to both 401ks and health plans. Um, not a lot of people know that it applies to health plans, but it does. Uh, for, under 401k, it makes sense, right? You don't want the owners of the business to be able to, to maximize their contributions and get extra, extra money. So what non-qualified deferred compensation plans are for and all that other fun stuff, right? But Section 105H applies to 401ks, retirement plans, things like that. It also applies to group health plans from a discriminatory perspective. Um, I've actually had conversations with IRS agents on 105H as it applies to health plans and how they plan to ever audit it. And they laugh because according to them, uh, off the record, of course, uh, they say this is one of those things that some guy or girl in a suit in Washington, D.C. gets passed. And we all laugh and go, yeah, OK, we can never quantify it. We can never track it. And even if we could, there's no money in it. So we're never spending the time to go after it. OK. And so it's one of those things where we always run our clients plans through 105H testing. We want to make sure that they're compliant. But if they're not, we don't lose a lot of sleep over it. Because the specific IRS agent I had spoke to had been an IRS agent for over 20 years, and he said he'd never audited one in the next 20 years. If he's still working, he'll never audit one. Uh, and he said, we'll never get the, the requirement to do it. Now, that's part one of the answer. Part two here is um, documentation. It's important because here's where something's going to come up. If an employee wants to be someone who gets disgruntled and wants to come after you uh, and they get a good a labor attorney, they may ask for documentation around the last time you RFP'd your plan. Now, I will tell you that we, uh, Ellerbrock GDP, we document anytime we RFP the plan. I've got uh, files for every client going back to 2011 when we started the benefits division of every RFP that we've ever done, every market check, all of that. What you're going to want to do is just make sure that either you or your broker has that, they've got that in a file that if needed, you could have it that shows, hey, we checked the market. Now, what does checking the market mean? Does that mean that we're chasing rate? No, I would strongly encourage you that not to do that. Why? Because good work ain't cheap and cheap work ain't good. And if you go find the cheapest TPA out there, you're probably going to get the cheapest work and your claims fund is going to go in disarray because they're not managing your claims very well. 
So, but the important thing to do, I think, is not every year, not, you know, it, it's to regularly say, hey, are we in line with the market? In other words, are we, are we doing the right things for our employees and having that documented in a file? And if you've got a broker that's keeping that great, you need to make sure you have access to it in the event uh, that you ever get a whistleblower disgruntled employee. By the way, going back to what I said earlier on those fully insured groups that with an SPD, the DOL is likely never going to come knock on your door if you're fully insured and say, can we see a copy of your SPD? I've been doing this for nearly 20 years. I've only heard of, I've only had two DOL audits in my career. Both of them were on self-funded plans, but I have heard of them going after fully insured and asking for it. But that's usually when they've got an employee who's gone out, they've hired an attorney because they're mad because they got fired or they felt like they were passed up on. And the attorney knows that 99.9% .9 of fully insured plans don't have an SPD. And that's an easy place to go to start freaking people out to try to get a settlement. So there you go um, on all of that. But yeah, I think, listen, it's good to do a random market check every once in a while, keep that documented, letting the market know you did it in the event you were ever audited, which you likely won't be. Um, you've got it in a document somewhere that, yeah, we checked the market to see where we were. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, I appreciate you uh, expanding on that, Seth. And, and as we um, you know, continue to talk through some of these things and the potential impact to you, know, you as the employer, you know, there, there is a lot of gray area um, right now, as Seth mentioned, you know, with the passage of the Affordable Care Act, you know, it took, it took a while. Um, and this is, this is something that, you know, we feel like that obviously it's gonna take a while, you know, to actually enforce some of these things that are included within the Consolidated Appropriations Act. But again, the, the purpose of the webinar today was really just to inform everyone of what it is and just what to expect um, moving forward. So, you know, two years down the road, you know, you're not shocked um, by one of these things um, and kind of at that point scrambling to, you know, make the necessary changes um, that you need to make. So one area, Seth, we'll kind of, and I'll kind of dive into those four key areas now of the CAA. Um, and obviously, as we know, there's, you know, a lot of this stuff is, is they're still trying to figure a lot of this stuff out, you know, how they would monitor it. Um, but one of the, the first thing is, is when it talks about removing gag clauses from service provider contracts and price and quality information, and really the prohibition of the gag clause is all about transparency to give employees the necessary information they need to make cost-effective healthcare decisions. And we obviously, as um, at Ella Brock Norris and GDP Advisors, believe firmly and obviously we want to make sure that the employees have access to the necessary information so they can be um, good consumers of healthcare. We talk about that a lot. Is how do we help employees become better consumers of healthcare? And when we say better, um, really what we're referring to is, you know, there's a big, there can be a big cost difference between, you know, one facility to the next. And also, typically the cheaper facility um, has the better quality of care. Now, with that being said, Seth, you know, one of the things that they talked about um, in the Consolidated Appropriations Act and from conversations that I've had is, one of the, the action items or you know, things to think about is um, that I've heard from other people is reviewing third party administrator and other provider agreements for gag clauses, um, which much, uh, must be removed. Can you maybe just touch on that a little bit? Is that something that you know, is common or what's your experience with gag clauses when you think of you know, third party administrators? Well, there's, there's a couple of things. Um, and you know, gag clauses are typically, I mean, they are what they sound like, right? You can't talk about it. <laughs> um, and so a couple of key things are, remember, as a plan fiduciary under HIPAA, you have a, a, a right to understand and know what's going on, but you also have to be um, very protective of that information. And so one of the things is making sure that you as the plan sponsor can understand what's going on inside of the group health plans, that you can effectively build it appropriately, right? We want to make sure that the plan is operating to the best uh, value for our employees. Well, if you don't have access to the information to do that, it's hard to build a plan that's going to be the best interest of your employees, the participants. Um, so part of it's there. The secondary part is a lot of TPAs are owned by or or bound by gag order contracts that are part of the insurance networks. So when we're thinking about transparency and things like that, um, a lot of times in the past, there have been direct contracts between a provider and an insurance network or a provider and a pharmaceutical PBM or something of that sort for pharmacists and things like that, that uh, did not allow them to share information with participants that might allow them to access care at a lower cost. In other words, if you were in network, and I'm going to pick, I'm going to pick on a network. This is just I could pick on any one of the 
major networks, but let's just pick on Cigna. Let's say if you were a network with Cigna and I'm a provider, I very well might have a gag clause as part of my provider contract saying that I can't share contract uh, pricing information with a participant that might, you know, steer them in a different direction than 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 what I when what Cigna may want to have happen. So those have been essentially removed, which is good. Uh, you shouldn't have those. If a provider thinks there's a cheaper option, they should be able to do it. And a lot of providers already were, but this just removes that. Same, we saw it a lot in the pharmacy side of things too, where a pharmacist, maybe they knew there was a lower cost drug or or there was a lower cost component of a drug. Well, they would, under gag order, would not be uh, permitted to tell the plan participant, hey, by the way, you're taking Vomovo. Did you know that that's just naproxen and, um, you know, like it, it, they couldn't they couldn't go down that road. Um, and so this removes that. So this is a good move in the right direction. So I think that this allowing plan sponsors and uh, HIPAA officers of the plan, by the way, if you're in a plan, you're required to have a HIPAA officer um, of the plan. So allowing those people to have better access to information from TPA is fantastic. And, and removing those things from the networks, that's really important too. Yeah. And do you think, Seth, when we think of, obviously, we talk a lot about data and, you know, access to, to claims data. And and as, you know, you all know that are, are on this call, you know, if you're fully insured, you know, the, the amount of data that you get access to is it's very limited. And and one of the things that it expands on, again, this is a 6,000 page document. There's a lot that's included in here in it, but it talks about, you know, sharing information with the plan sponsor to identify waste and develop strategies to reduce it. And when we think of fully insured plans, in your opinion, Seth, obviously, and this is this is strictly your opinion, do you think we will ever get to the point with within a fully insured plan that the plan sponsor will get full access to data? Um, I certainly hope so. When we say full access, that's the real there's a that's a broad question, right? Because so for example, our office uh, here uh, that I reside in is in Texas, right? So I uh, spent a lot of time up in our Nebraska offices, but we have an office here in North Texas, and that just happens to be where I live because that's where my wife and kids are. So uh, but nonetheless, uh, I you know, here in Texas, we have what was passed years ago, which uh, was a House bill twenty fifteen that said effectively that, all, all fully insured carriers are required on any group plan, regardless of size, to provide key aspects of data, including uh, monthly managed medical loss ratio information uh, and what are called tier two or claims over and above $15,000 in a given year, claimants generating more than $15,000. It's been a fantastic law. It's really helped Texas-based employers, uh, under, fully insured employers, understand where their costs are, negotiate those costs with insurance companies. Uh, and understand, well, this is a good time to go self-funded, or here's what I need to know if I need to go in self-funded arena. My hope is that that's what ultimately happens with the CAA, is that many other states go, okay, well, we're going to be bound by this. We're going to have to provide some of this data. This is one of those things, though, Phil, you've said it a number of times, that we just don't know. Uh, we just don't know how the ultimate final regulations are going to come out on this and where insurance companies will land on it. I will say this. The healthcare lobby in Washington, and for those of you that have been on my webinars before, or our webinars before, you've heard me say this. The healthcare lobby, um, and that encompasses health insurance and pharmaceutical companies and hospital systems, which, by the way, are all in very much collusion with one another in many ways. Not all of them, but some of them. Um, you know, it's the largest single lobby in Washington. It, it, it's larger than tobacco, guns, defense. Uh, and oil and gas combined. So you take all those other big four, you combine them, they're not as big as the healthcare lobby. So what does that mean? Well, it means that there's gonna be a lot of sway that's pushed around, a lot of power that's pushed around as regulations come out. So it'll be interesting to see. I'm hopeful that under the CAA, we get to a place where fully insured clients can get data. They certainly should have it. Um, it's how the carriers are, are, are generating the rate. Um, but unfortunately, as of right now, you don't. My hope is the CAA will change that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and I appreciate that, Seth. Um, now, one, the the second key area is your reporting requirements for prescriptions, and and this is we could spend we could spend hours talking about this, but just because there's there's so much in limbo and there's not really anything set in stone here, you know, it's it don't really feel like we can, you know need to spend a lot of time um, when it comes to you know the fact that obviously the CAA is just saying that it's establishing re reporting requirements for prescriptions. Um, Seth, anything you want to just touch on there, and then we can kind of uh, get to the last two points and then kind of talk about, you know, potential things to, to think about moving forward or maybe any action items. Now, listen, I think that this is this is one of those things that's been pushed out. So right now, I think it's slated to go into place at the end of this year, but it could get pushed out again. 
Uh, it was originally supposed to be slated to go into a place uh, at the end of last year, effectively requiring plan sponsors to uh, provide uh, the federal government with a list of their top drugs. So Health and Human Services and the Labor Department. Uh, the, top, the top utilized prescription drugs, name brand drugs, uh, overall pricing costs of those. Um, I have no problem with this from a perspective of, I know a lot of people are a little queasy when it comes to government having information, but as we all know, prescription drug prices in the United States are uh, double, quadruple, even 10 times fold that of other developed nations. Uh, and that in large part, um, in, in some of you have heard me say this, I, I, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater there. It's because the rest of the United States subsidizes the rest of the world when it comes to prescription drugs. Yes, are pharmaceutical companies massively profitable? Yes, are PBMs massively profitable? Yes. Should we find a way to uh, reduce the access to those middlemen? Absolutely. My hope is that's what this reporting is meant to do, is to allow the federal government to really understand the impact that pharmacy benefit managers or PBMs have on the overall price of the drug um, and what's really going on. Uh, will they utilize this data when negotiating for Medicaid and Medicare services? Maybe. Maybe that's part of it, right? So we know that there's been a big push by both the Trump administration and the Biden administration to allow the federal government to now negotiate directly with pharmaceutical companies under CMS, something they had not been able to do in the past under Medicare Part D. Um, and so maybe it's part of that. But nonetheless, I wouldn't get too worked up over this. It's something that will be easily gathered if it's put in place by the PBM, the pharmacy benefit manager. So it's not anything that you yourself are going to go, oh my gosh, I had to go track uh, you know, prescriptions that my employees are filling. No, you don't. Uh, that's what the PBM is for. Uh, that's what part of that joinder arrangement that you have with them is that they've got all access to all that data. And if it comes out, uh, there'll be an easy report that will be able to be gathered and filed. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, I appreciate you touching on that. Um, now, kind of moving on to the third um, key area is just where it talks about the, it requires the disclosure of direct and indirect compensation from all service providers. Now, this is obviously an area where, um, you know, we uh, as a company uh, believe in full transparency, as I mentioned earlier. And when it comes to um, the fee um, that we um, charge to our clients per employee per month, um, it is a flat fee. It is very transparent. Um, we, it is, it is made known to our clients before we even start working with them. And this is something that's reviewed every year. Um, around renewal time and it's, and it's laid out all of the different fees from indirect, obviously, um, providers as well, any resources or tools that are included within their plan. It's all break, broken down, you know, uh, for our clients to, to clearly see. Now, um, I myself obviously don't have the experience that, that you have, Seth, in the industry, but the little experience that I do have specifically in the fully insured space um, and, and with some of the smaller groups that we work with um, is, you know, when, when I've engaged in conversations with prospective clients or business owners, um, you know, when, when you talk, when this conversation gets brought up about, you know, what they're paying their broker or advisor, um, it, it is truly amazing to see how many times that business owner or prospective client, whoever I'm, I'm speaking with, they don't know what they're paying their broker. And it's because it's hidden in fine print in uh you know these uh, proposals these quotes and it's not something that um really is is talked about and it's almost like in the fully insured space it's for for the longest time it's people know that their broker's getting paid um and really that's all that they they know so with this obviously um and with you know how we operate as a company it's not something that you know we really have any um, reason to, to worry about and there's nothing that we really need to change but with that being said, you know, one thing that after having conversations with, you know, many different people about this is, is for everyone that's on this call is, you know, if, if, if there is, you know, the, the broker that you're working with um, or advisor, you know, if you are not aware of what you're paying your broker, I would definitely um, challenge you to at least ask or inquire about it because it's something that within this CAA, is, it should be being disclosed um, to you in some form or some fashion. If that's around renewal time, um, you know, great, but it, it, you, it needs to be available uh, to you because again, obviously, you know, people can get, you know, people are getting paid a lot of money um, to essentially place a fully insured product um, for, your, you know, employers. So that's something that, again, I don't, we're not here to obviously talk bad about anyone's, uh, you know, broker advisor, anyone that, um, you know, uh, you guys are working with. 
but it is something to at least think about. Um, and it's something that we pride ourselves on um, is full transparency, because as Seth um, mentioned many times is um, great work ain't cheap and cheap work ain't great. I'm pretty sure I might've, I might've butchered that. Uh, but uh, that's, I just wanted to touch on that. Seth, anything to add there? I know, again, it's kind of a, it's a situation where we're not here to talk bad about anyone, but anything you want to add there? No, I, listen, I think that if you have a question about your broker's compensation, you should ask it. I think Phil said that, um, it, you know, um, the, our industry, the, specifically on the health insurance side, um, there have been a lot of ways to hide compensation. There still are. Um, and, and, and I'll tell you, that's made for a difficult decision. Some of you I see on the, on the, on here are, are clients and maybe when you saw what, what we charged, uh, you know, you, you went, well, wait a minute, what? That's not what my broker, I'm, that's not what I'm paying my broker. And I'm like, oftentimes what we find out is it's absolutely what you're paying your broker. And a lot of times even more, you're paying them more uh, when we're able to get in there and dive in. Um, one specific client, uh, obviously won't mention them by name. We found hundreds of thousands of dollars in compensation going to the broker that was never disclosed because it was hidden in the pharmacy benefit manager. Effectively, every time somebody would go, use their ID card and get a drug, the broker was getting a cut of the cost of the drug. It was a negotiated deal they made with a pharmacy benefit manager. Uh, and because it was under a marketing fee, um, you know, it was easy to hide. It didn't show up on a 5,500 report. So if you're over 100 lives, you have to file a 5,500 shows compensation. Uh, it's not 5,500 reportable. Uh, and, and that's just the sad thing. When we launched the benefits division in 2011, uh, we said from the day one that we were going to remove the misaligned incentives uh, where when costs go up, we make more money or uh, when we add more stuff and try to do funky things, we can get paid more to do it and hide it. We just weren't going to go that route. Now, in addition to that, and I didn't say this earlier, we operate under a counselor's license uh, here at Eller Brock GDP. So uh, it, in some states it's consulting, in some states it's counselor. So even if we're just the broker, we still operate under those licenses, meaning we have a liability to you. We have fiduciary responsibility to you, the client. Um, and so this is something we've always been, we've always adopted, which is full transparency and no hidden compensation. Um, unfortunately, the rest of our industry does not always adopt that. Now, what does that mean about this? My hope is that the CAA starts to bring, a, you know, shine a light on this, right? Uh, how did, what's the best disinfectant? Light. Um, and, and it shines a light on it. But that being said, there's still ways to get around it, I'm sure. Uh, we've read through it. Um, and, and sadly, there, it seems like there's going to be some ways that, that brokers are going to be able to get around it if they want to. My hope is that they won't. I hope that this, this will bring into alignment uh, you know, or into the light what they are making. Uh, if you are a client of ours, you, you likely already received a notice from us. So um, that this is one of those things where it was asked of brokers to go ahead and do this, but it was done in good faith of, hey, there's no real hard, fast rules of how you calculate it. And I will tell you, this is one of those things where the devil is going to be in the details and we're going to really need to understand. For example, um, a lot of our compensation here at Alibrock GDP is based on your overall employment population. So uh, we have to make an estimation on what we think your enrollment population is going to be over the next year. Uh, for some of our contracts, we get compensated based on the percentage of savings off claims uh, and things that we do. H how can we estimate that? So I think there's a lot to be worked out here, but this is a good step in the right direction, I think, that maybe will require the rest of the industry to start ponying up and saying, hey, here's actually what we really make and not hide it. My fear is um, is that uh, if there's a drip, somebody's going to find a way to put a bucket there. And if, if there was a miss in how this law was written, somebody's going to find a way to hide compensation. But listen, uh, most business owners have that good spidey sense. And if you've got a good spidey sense, uh, ask about it. Second thing is recognize, and you know, as many of our clients did when we've come in and said, well, here's what we charge. And they go, wait a minute, that's not what my broker makes. Um, yeah, it probably is. <laughs> uh, you just probably don't know about it. So it's important to know all, all of those details. Unfortunately, there's just so many ways to, to hide things. You may not know them all. No, yeah, absolutely. And I appreciate you touching on that, Seth, because again, it's, it's, it's a great thing, obviously, for employers, um, you know, with, with what's included within the CAA around this topic, you know, if, if we got to a point where um, it was able to be monitored, that's the other thing, too, is, is how would you ever, you know, thinking about how would, you know, how would the, this be monitored um, is, is hard to wrap your head around. Um, but um, again, it is a great thing um, for employers. Um, and it's something to just at least be aware of and be thinking about.
Yeah, now, Phil, let me mention one other thing there, and, and I will mention them by name because I think it warrants being mentioned by name. We had uh, one group one time, but we had taken over on Broker Record. We were in the process of moving them into a self-funded platform. We were contacted by the fully insured carrier, which I won't say their full name, but I think their initials are BCBS. But um, anyway, they uh, effectively offered us a $30,000 check not to move the group. 30000 And it was like, literally, if you'll tell us you won't move the group, if you'll fully insure renew them, uh, we'll give them you a good renewal. We'll write you a check for 30 grand. Just do it. Um, we didn't, obviously. And we immediately contacted the client and said, you need to know we were just offered this. Um, what the CAA will hopefully do is eliminate carriers doing that uh, because they know that ultimately the, the broker is going to have to disclose that because that's not anything new. Um, you know, carrier bonuses, contingency bonuses, things like that, are that they happen. Now, do we receive some? Sure, we do sometimes. So, a volume of business with a carrier can oftentimes generate what we call a contingency bonus, which means that if you have a bunch of business with one carrier, they'll look at it at the end of the year based on the overall um, book. Uh, they'll say, "Hey, we're, we'll, we'll, we'll send you a bonus check because of the amount of business you have." Um, well, I will tell you what we do that with that here is we actually utilize that as part of our employee compensation bonus structure for our employees. So if you don't like it, that's fine. I'll let you tell your account manager. Um, but that, that, that's what those dollars go to. And it's limited because, again, because of the way that we operate self-funded business, we don't get them from any of the medical carriers. Every once in a while, we'll get one from a dental carrier, a vision carrier, things like that. But because we run our own risk pools in the self-funded space, large part, we don't have enough volume. Uh, with any one carrier, uh, like a Blue Cross United Signal Aetna, on a direct basis to generate those, and the indirect basis in which we do business with them uh, doesn't qualify for those types of bonuses. But if they ever did, we would certainly disclose it. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, Seth, but another way that you know we use some of those, um, you know, some of that compensation is, you know, to provide the Ben Advent systems to our clients at no cost, which is not always the case, you know, with other uh, brokers. Yeah, there's a lot of different things that we can do with a lot of those dollars. Um, and, and what we do is we reinvest them back into primarily the employees and then um, anywhere else we can enhance the, the value for the plan. But again, as I mentioned, uh, because we don't get any from health carriers, mm -hmm. there's no health bonuses. And that's, you know, 90% of the overall premium dollars. Uh, we're not talking about uh, earth shattering dollars here. But if they were, you would have gotten it notified on your disclosure statement, which you received from us. Uh, if you did not get a disclosure statement uh, from your broker, you probably ought to pick up the phone and ask them why, because they were required to have done it by now. No, yeah, absolutely. I appreciate that, um, Seth. Now, last last topic I want to um, touch on, and I know um, we're coming up uh, with about 14 minutes left, is you know the fourth, obviously, carry it key area being, you know, requiring parity and substance abuse and mental health benefits. And this has been something that, you know, when we think of mental health benefits over the last, um, you know, 18, 24 months, this has become more and more popular because obviously everything that, um, you know, Americans have been dealing with um, when it comes to COVID, working at home, um, all of the, the different, um, you know, things that have been thrown at people, it's became mental health benefits have become um, a key uh, benefit uh, within an employee benefits program. And the CAA essentially creates new requirements for group health plans to ensure um, compliance with mental health parity and addiction. And then it also um, prohibits um, uh, group health plans that offer mental health and substance abuse benefits from giving less favorable terms and conditions uh, than for medical and surgical benefits. So essentially mental health benefits need to be equal uh, to medical benefits within a group plan. Now, obviously, you know, we understand um, the importance of, of offering a mental health benefit because at the end of the day, our, you know, your, your employees are your greatest asset and everything that they've been dealing with um, over, you know, the last two years and even, you know, for longer than that, um, but really, this mental health benefits become more and more popular. You know, as of recent, we understand that this is this is extremely important, especially because you know, if employees don't have a resource to go to or to utilize, you know, how are they going to work through um, you know that stress or that issue or whatever it is that's weighing on them? So, 
Seth, anything to, to maybe add, anything to maybe any uh, recommendations, you know, when it comes to mental health and what's included within, you know, an employer-sponsored health plan? Yeah, I mean, listen, I think that, so, uh, Phil, you may have mentioned it. So, mental health parity was part of the Affordable Care Act. So, the, uh, it, it effectively had set a minimum standard that qualified plans uh, that were in compliance with the ACA had to have mental health benefits. What this is now saying is we had to make sure that those mental health benefits, behavioral health benefits are in alignment with every other benefit, i.e. surgical hospitalization. Um, so that's already been done. If, if, you, if you've got that, it, your, your plan has been amended to it. Um, so again, reputable TPA, you're doing the right things. You're going to be fine here. Here's where I want to caution people, though, because um, there's really two parts of the whole uh, mental health benefit valuation that I think are really important because this gets missed a lot. Um, we think about how your plan is going to treat uh, mental health, behavioral health, and things like that. Uh, but then we also have to think about how the healthcare system, the complex, is treating it. Um, mental health, for example, it's hard to find in network hospitals for that, that, that treat it as an inpatient service. Uh, historically, those hospitals have been out of network, um, meaning I mean, we're, we're working on a claim right now uh, of an uh, unfortunate young lady who who the bills are averaging about $100,000 a month uh, for an inpatient service. Um, and this is, this is one of the really sad aspects of our healthcare system is that if you want a quality facility, you're gonna be hard pressed to find them in network. Um, and, and so we need to be, understand that while yes, there are certain mental health benefits that need to be part of your plan, they have to be in alignment with that, there's still gonna be issues as a result of out of network benefits. Um, this is an important aspect for self-funded employers. How's your plan going to treat it uh, under the law and, and the way that current structures are? Uh, health insurers or networks, right, if you're fully insured or self-funded, um, I should say, they have the ability to reimburse what is at the UCR, usual and customary rate, which is a fraction of what most of these companies will charge, most of these hospitals will charge. Um, for the one in particular that I'm talking about, we get $100,000 a bill on average a month. The maximum the carrier will, will allow for reimbursement is 16000 meaning uh, that the family is responsible for $84,000. Now, a lot of times people look and say, well, that's terrible at the insurance company. Uh, and you will know, those of you who know me well, I don't defend insurance companies often. Um, this is one where I will. It has nothing to do with the insurance company. It has everything to do with the hospital facility themselves, which is a massive, profitable industry that, in my opinion, again, opinion, plague, uh, plays off of the emotion uh, of parents in large part or loved ones. So uh, this is this is one of those things, my hope is that under the CAA, this is a first step in a many step, uh, many directions we need to go to get mental health uh, adopted into health plans, but also into the healthcare system as from an access perspective, um, like every other aspect is, right? One thing we didn't talk about, Phil, real quick, I'll touch on it, we didn't, we talk, we didn't talk much about the No Surprises Act, um, that's part of the CAA, meaning that there's no more surprise building allowed if you go to an in-network facility and get an out-of-network charge. Now, what does that ultimately mean? Well, that, that juice is going to get squeezed out uh, in health insurance premiums. If you're self-funded, uh, it could be built into the claims charge because there's arbitration involved and stuff like that. So these are things to be aware of. While I'm all for the elimination of surprise bills to members, um, we need to make sure that there are some guidelines here so we don't get healthcare systems run amok to feel like they can go through into some ar type of arbitration and get squeeze money out of the health plans. Um, but again, going back to mental health parity and, and what that means out of the, a the, the CAA, this is just making sure that your plan provides benefits in for mental health, behavioral health in alignment with all the other benefits. This isn't some carved out deal. Um, a lot of time, man, 10 years ago, plans, a lot of plans just didn't even offer benefits for mental health, behavioral health at all. So I'm glad to see that we've come full circle here. That does need to be part of the overall plan. We still have a long way to go to make sure that this uh, side of healthcare uh, is treated the way it should be uh, and is uh, accessible the way that it should be. But uh, it's a good first step. No, absolutely. Now, obviously, we, we're coming up on time here. Um, we, uh, I wanted to mention, if, you, if anyone has any questions, I know we've, we've covered a lot, um, but uh, feel free to post those questions in the, the chat box. You can also unmute yourself and ask the, uh, your question. Um, and 
we obviously understand that, you know, again, there's a lot that's included in here. And, to, and today, you know, the purpose of this webinar was, again, just to introduce um, everyone to what the CAA is and really, you know, what to be thinking about moving forward if, in fact, some of this stuff does get enforced. Um, you know, for example, uh, one thing that, you know, comes to mind is if, the, as tra if transparency continues to increase when it comes to healthcare and employers start to receive more uh, data from um, the insurance carrier, what are, you know, what are you then going to do with that data? You know, what strategies do you have in place or, or maybe what strategies have you thought through um, that you could potentially uh, implement. So it's just that's just something to think about is if you did get access to more data, what would you then do with that data? Um, we obviously are huge believers in data. Everything that we really do um, is driven on the data and what the data is showing us. Um, so that's one thing to kind of to kind of think through. Um, Seth, if you uh, if you want to add anything as far as you know, just kind of not action items, but, you know, just some things to think about moving forward. Um, if you want to just maybe touch on a few and then I can kind of add a, a couple in there and then we'll uh, wrap up here. Yeah, I think as is the case in all things, um, don't put your head in the sand when it comes to anything regulatory or compliance based. Don't don't think, oh, well, that won't ever get me. Um, be in the know. Kudos to you for being on this webinar to learn a little bit more about it. Um, that would be my big advice as we kind of leave here. Uh, also recognize that uh, while there is a lot of, um, you know, partisanship in Washington, one thing that there does seem to be a lot of bipartisanship around right now is healthcare. believe it or not. Uh, that thing that divided us <laughs> as a nation for so long, now it does seem like the parties are coming together and saying, enough's enough, we got to do something. Uh, and so I would expect that Listen, healthcare as we go into election season is going to be top of mind. Don't be surprised if we don't get some more things passed. Don't think, be surprised if we get some more regulatory aspects uh, out of this CAA plan or any other stimulus plan, build back better, things like that that might be coming along. So be paying attention, making sure you're working with people that are paying attention. Awesome. Thank you, Seth. Um, and then the last couple of things that I'll mention is, again, I talked a little bit about, you know, if, if, if we do get to a point where, you know, fully insured plans are, are getting access to more data, you know, what just thinking about, you know, what you would then do with that data. Um, the other thing to think about is, um, and we talked about at the beginning is, you know, understanding that you are the fiduciary and, you know, what you are, um, things to do to essentially limit your liability um, as the fiduciary. Just something to think about. Um, and then the last thing is, um, you know, again, when it comes to the indirect and direct uh, compensation from service providers. Um, again, I would just, uh, if you are not aware or if you, um, you know, if there's some gray area with, with what you are compensating your broker or any service provider um, that you're working with, I would just advise to just ask, um, ask them, you know, to provide something for you. Um, so then you obviously, you know, you're able to see that um, and you have access to that information because again, it, it's, it should be available for, uh, to you and it should be transparent. Um, so that's, uh, that's really all that I had. Um, again, I appreciate everyone jumping on today. I know, you know, any compliance or legislative um, webinars, you know, they can, they're not the most exciting, but again, we really pride ourselves on educating our clients and prospective clients because we wanna be looked at as that advisor, um, you know, when, when anything comes up. Um, so, Again, reach out to us if you have questions. I know there was no questions today, but please, if there's something that you want more information on, if you want to ask a specific question, um, you know, that's directly related to your plan, um, reach out to us. We're more than happy to answer your questions or hop on a 10, 15 minute call, even if you're not a client. Um, again, we want to make sure that people understand this. People have the information, the resources that they need to, to be prepared for, you know, if some of this stuff does get enforced um, down the road. So. Thanks for listening uh, in everyone. And again, we will uh, we'll provide the recording of the webinar once it's uh, once it's available. Thanks everybody. Thanks. Thanks Seth. Thanks to everyone.